Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with probably the best coach um, in all of college tennis. Uh, a man that's went to three different programs, turned them all around, um, known as a very famous recruiter, also known for being on the ride with Stevie Johnson when he won 72 matches in a row at USC. Um, he is the legendary Peter Smith. Peter, thanks for coming to the show. Yeah, just great, great to be here. Great to uh, be on it and happy to, happy to share my experiences. So the first time I actually laid eyes on you, you know, you always have your fisherman's hat on, right? And I was like, you know. Where is it? I got it here. Right, right. I got like, it. That was my thing. Who's, who's the guy, full gray in the beard, full, like, full white hair, standing in the corner. You can, you got glasses on, face full of sunscreen, fisherman's hat, standing in the corner in Carson, California. Yeah. And it took me about three weeks. It's like, oh, that's Peter Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah. that makes sense now. So tell us about your journey. Because when I look about, when I look at your body of work, being the youngest coach in NCAA history at Fresno. Number one, how did you get the job, right? Is it because, you know, we play college tennis and we know college tennis is like the runt, right, of college athletics. You get the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team, and then, you know, the college tennis team historically at some of the smaller schools, they boost the, the athletic GPA, right? We're like, we need all you guys to get all A's. How did you get the job um, and become the youngest uh, head coach in NCAA history. Yeah, you know, just just timing, uh, just luck. Uh, I mean, it, it it's look. I I grew up in Connecticut and played every sport. My dad retired. My mom said, "We're out of here. I'm not spending another winter here." I was 13, 14, ninth grade. Moved to North County, San Diego, La Costa Country Club. Pancho Segura was my coach. Bobby Riggs, Lorne Kuehl. All the characters that hang out, hung out there, incredible. Went to Long Beach State, and Long Beach was the place I first started. And, you know, I, I went to school for four years. I, I said, I, it's time for me to play. I mean, I was, the, I was the fifth kid in my family. I was the youngest of five, and my mom and dad were a little tired. And they're like, just do whatever you want. And I saw it. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I didn't graduate, so... I just went off, started playing. I mean, I was, I was good. I played one at Long Beach State, but I wasn't like turning pro. I was just going to play some pro tournaments. So that we all know that's a big difference. And so I went out there, played. I was like 350 in the world, played qualities of US Open, qualities of Wimbledon, you know, just doing okay, but nothing big and trying to like figure it out in my head, what's going on. And I played Michael Chang in Kansas City, hottest day of my life. I was like, I, I had chills. It was way past heat and he beat the crap out of me. I walked up the court, walked up to my doubles partner, Roger Smith. And I said, it's time to go back to school. Uh, the kid down the street, Michael grew up like seven houses down from me in La Costa, just kicked my butt. I obviously don't belong here. And <laughs> I got, I remember I walked off and I said, I think I've picked out my last class. So I went back to school. I had 21 units to graduate. I probably would have gone out and played, which was bad because, well, it wasn't such a bad loss a month later when he went around at the U.S. Open. But uh, in September, my coach, Larry Easley, walked in and he said, hey, I'm quitting tomorrow and I'm going to tell them to hire you. <laughs> like, what? What are you talking about? And uh, so I had to go interview for the job. My One of my teachers set up a, a panel right in the middle of the class, stop class. They all asked me questions. I went straight from the class to the interview and, you know, I went and they gave me the job. I mean, what I realized later was the the job, them giving it to a 23 year old with zero experience that was still in school, um, right. was the first step in them eliminating the program. I mean, right, right, right. You know, if you give it to a 23 year old, you don't really have the experience to fight back. But, you know, half the team were my teammates. They're my buddies. They're my drinking buddies. And, uh, 
you know, I said, hey, we can't go out anymore and you can't call me Peter. And they're like, jump. And they said a couple of things. We're not, calling, <laughs> we're not calling you coach. We're not. Right. I said, right. You're not calling me Peter. And they're like, we'll call you Co. So that was the nickname that sticks to this day to with some actually my youngest Coulter calls me Co. And it's I, I loved it. Actually, it was it was uh, it was really a good thing. So I just started coaching. Didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I, I tried real hard. Right. So you, you, you clearly knew something because you got them the top five in the country. Right. But let me say this. Some people could look and say, OK, you're coaching at Fresno State. It's in California. It's a big state with a lot of tennis pedigree. Of course, you can recruit. But there also is a lot of competition. You got UCLA, USC, Pepper, uh, you got Tau Berkeley. I mean, there's a lot of competition to recruit those California kids. So on the surface, it looks like it's easy to fill a team with Chicago, with California kids. But it's also really hard because of the number of good universities. How did you build sort of, I would consider it to be a small school, right? How do you consider, how did you build that program into a top five contender? Well, when I was recruiting at Long Beach State and Fresno State, if someone said they were interested in SC or UCLA, I just stopped recruiting them. So that was easy. <laughs> Um, but you know, look, Southern Cal has the deepest pool of players. And if a kid is ranked 30, 35 in Southern Cal, they're a very good tennis player. And I still don't think coaches understand that how deep the pool here is in Southern Cal. It's way deeper than the South, than Florida, than Chicago, than Texas, all the hot spots in the country. It just there's just a lot of players. And back then there were a lot of players. And um, my best team at Fresno State, actually, we had two twins, uh, Brian and Ryan Junio, who were great. They were both from Cerritos, California, Southern Cal. We had two Bulgarians and two Swedes. And then, you know, we had a, a kid from the Valley, Jay Pergonier. And so, you know, it wasn't all Southern Cal kids. You, you know, you, uh, you know, I called it Noah's Ark. We were just two of everything on that team. <laughs> But they were they were darn good, and Ricard Berg lost in the finals in the NCAs, and the Cecil Mamet, and oh yeah, you know, it was just you know all of that is luck, and I really believe the harder you work, the luckier you get, and you got to work hard and keep your eyes open. And I I used my contacts from traveling and playing and my old friends, and you know I, I was able to get the Swedes, and I was just paying attention to get the Bulgarians. Uh, you know, Ivan Kiskanov and Blago Petrov, two great guys. And, you know, you just work. And, and that's, I always enjoyed working. So, so let me ask you this, because that brings up a, a hot topic is um, recruiting of foreign students to tennis teams in America. Yeah. What's your take on it? I mean, I, obviously our jobs are to win, right, as a coach. And you love to be able to win with the kid who's already in the USDA system, already in the States, already sort of local. But if your goal is to win and you do have, you know, obviously you're going to Wimbledon and for a job, you develop relationships with other coaches, the federations, right? And the kid might be just short of a junior slam, right? Just sort of 128 in the world, ITF, but can play. Those relationships can help you, you know, find a diamond in the rough. What is your view on recruiting overseas um, versus like sort of, you know, working harder to find homegrown talent. I say we got to raise the bottom of U.S. tennis so that we can compete more globally. I agree. And there, there needs to be just a level playing field so we're all dealing with the same rules. Look, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association dealt, dealt with this for many years. I was, a, you know, always tried to be one of their leaders. And we, we had it on the table to vote. Half of our scholarships have to go to American players. I was 100% for it. We didn't pass it. It was a mistake. Half of our scholarships should be going to U.S. players, period. Not even a question mark. That would hurt a school like Fresno State because it helps a school like SC and UCLA and, and you know, the powerhouses. But, you know, Fresno State doesn't have a team. Long Beach State doesn't have a team. Maybe if we had some Amer more Americans on those teams, they would have been, you know, they'd still be around. So that was a mistake. We should be promoting U.S. tennis 100%. And, 
it's hard enough. But I always believe that, you know, look, my best teams at SC, if I had one, two or three foreigners on the team, I thought it was great for the American kids. Because look, who comes here from Europe? Who comes here from South America? The most open-minded, you know, kind of mature kids. Like, right. like turn it around. If all the universities in the in the world were in Europe, which of our American kids would go there? Right. Right. It's a different, a different. We we get kind of the most mature kids coming here, yeah. and uh, so it, I I really felt like. The, the Europeans on the team, they would tell the Americans, what are you guys doing? Like drinking, like, why are you going out? This is stupid. You're here to like, look at this opportunity because the American kids grow up, they see the stadiums, they see what we have and they take it for granted. But the Europeans come over here and they're like, well, huh? <laughs> you know? I mean, look over my career, you know, I was probably in charge of like 30 to $40 million in right. terms of fundraising in terms of budgets in terms of salaries in terms of scholarships i mean we raised 15 million at usc to improve our facility i mean 15 million to improve it right I mean, that that's nuts and right. so that the europeans come over and they're like this exists i had no idea this is right. incredible so they they have a, a a little bit of a different appreciation than, than the Americans. And, you know, so that's, that's just normal and natural. So you leave Fresno and obviously when you think about college coaches, right, it's sort of like a graduation. Uh, you leave in Fresno, go to sort of a, you know, the, a, a level up per se, you look at tennis eyes to Pepperdine. I remember Pepperdine had a good player, Chris Hill. Chris Hill was like a Pepperdine legend. Tell me why Pepperdine, because I'm sure you had other offers, right? We know you had California roots. Uh, it's probably great to stay in there where you got a name, probably easier to recruit. Uh, what other colleges were on the table at the time you chose Pepperdine? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I married a Southern Cal girl from Long Beach. I, um, my parents still lived in San Diego. Um, her parents lived in Long Beach. We wanted to get back to Southern Cal. I looked at schools like San Diego, San Diego State, uh, maybe Irvine was one. And, and I just kind of had, it, it was stupid on my part. I just had it in the back of my head. I'm going to get Pepperdine. Mm. I, I know I can do it. And I was in Fresno for six years and I loved Fresno. The people of Fresno are amazing people. And really it was probably in, in some ways the most enjoyable place I coached incredibly. Um, but you no, know, we wanted to get back to Southern Cal and Pepperdine came open and I was just super fortunate to get the position. And, you know, it was just, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of taking steps up the ladder, you know, and I was young and, uh, you know, full of <laughs> vigor and, and thought right. I, I could conquer the world and, and never questioned if I could do something or I, I couldn't do it. I, I just always thought I could do it. And, you know, I, in every step of the way, I always bet on myself and it was always bet on me, bet on you. I, I can do it, but it was just a confidence I had. And, uh, you know, when you look back on it, is it, you know, are you brave or stupid? You know, <laughs> that's right. a good line. And, and I, and I tiptoed through it and I, I knew just not enough <laughs> to not think I couldn't do it. And yeah. so. You know, I I loved every place I coached and loved all the student athletes. And, you know, it, and when you look back on it, you, you can really, really appreciate it all. So let me say this. When you look at today's environment, right? So you bet on yourself, but as a college coach in that time, where you're not really getting a lot of transfers, there's no NIL, there's no transfer portal, right? I look at the transfer portal now. Like you look at San Diego, right? Uh, State got to the, you know, NCAA championship game a good sort of eye, right? A good coach's eye, an eye for talent, can look at the transfer portal after they spent a year or two at a different school and put a team together in a year to compete for a national championship, right? But in that time, you were recruiting high school juniors and seniors. Yeah, they were top dog. Yeah, you went to see them play a match. They may or may not have been able to play in the best anybody that can really ball, right? But you had to see something. 
So when you were recruiting in that time, not having had them spend a year a year in college already playing the ITA and you saw them really tested, what did you look for? I mean, you know, it's kind of funny along the way, you know, when I was at Long Beach, when I was at Fresno, even when I was at Pepperdine, you know, you would never out recruit a Pac-12 school. You just would not out recruit SC or UCLA or Stanford or Berkeley. You just weren't going to do it. And I, and I, I didn't even try. I mean, it was, you know, you, you take your L's. And so I, you know, so it really prepared me for really, you know, getting those great kids because I didn't look at rankings, you know, and Dick Gould was, was the greatest coach and huge mentor to me. And he looked at rankings and I thought, well, he's looking at rankings, but I, I couldn't look at rankings because I couldn't get the best kids. So <laughs> I just always looked at like, will the kid listen? Will the kid work hard? And, and it's, you know, I, I was always just like, trust the gut, um, trust the gut, like watch the kid play. Is this someone I could coach? You know, I never knew the rankings of my players. And it's very frustrating for me now on the other end when I call college coaches and they ask for three letters. And, and that is very frustrating to me. What's yeah. the UTR? And they can't get past three letters. And when I was a recruit, I was not a good junior. Um, I was a talented junior, but I was not, did not have a good ranking. So you know, I said from very early on, you know, I, I just was kind of looking for uh, someone like myself who had some talent and who was just looking for an opportunity. And and that's all I ever looked for. Um, and, and were my players ranked high? Yes. Did I know their ranking? Absolutely not. Because I stopped looking at rankings and I would go to tournaments and you'd watch. Obviously, a lot of the kids I recruited won and you liked watching them win and you know, but if they lost, I'd go watch them play in the back draw. You know, how are they handling in between points? How are they handling losses? Like all of those like soft things that you look for in a tennis player that, you know, when I say soft, I don't mean like you're soft. I mean, just those soft, soft cues, those soft cues that, you know, how are they handling a missed shot on a big point? You know, all of those things. I, I just think those are, are very, very important. Yeah. So when I like, you know, I was like, assistant college coach I was a grad assistant for two or three years at my uh school Florida A&M who also doesn't now have a men's team I mean one conference like you know three of our four years right uh great coaches came out of our program great players and now all of a sudden we don't have a men's team so very frustrating um it's, it's a shame it's frustrating is right but I sit there I look at those tapes and I look at can they move right yeah. can they defend what does the body language look like when it matters, right? For all dudes, you know, do they go for, you know, kick serve when they, you know, serving for the match or do they go for the big one? I look at sort of those things just to see, 100%. you know, where, where can I trust them? And then I say, okay, where can I trust them in the lineup? I got this person might be my fourth best player, but I need him to be so dependable at number six, right? Or my fourth best player based on game style, is probably better playing at one or two because he plays better against bigger hitters, right? So it's like, that's sort of like, where can I fit them in a lineup? No matter where they, no matter where the challenge matches shake out, where yeah. do they best fit in my lineup? Yeah. And that's and sort that, of the, what I look for. And that's that's two different things, but I, I probably needed two minutes to watch a player. Uh-huh. I didn't need yeah. long, you know. But you also I, developed them because when you look at, when you land at these programs, you get a good recruit, you got them for four years. And if you look at how you built up these programs, you definitely grew the players that's there. And a testament to that is the kind of players that go. Tracy Austin doesn't send her son to USC unless she thinks he's going to actually improve under the person that's there, right? Stevie Johnson's dad does not send him Stevie to USC unless he felt like he was going to be in good hands. So what did you do to develop players once you had them i mean i, I the, the the only way to do that is one-on-one -on -one. one on one you know each morning was spent individually um, so clear so, that up for for the, the 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 parents of high school juniors and seniors now right because we think about okay hey as a team we're going to get up at 6 a.m we're going to run you go to class you come back to you know team practice at you know three o'clock and you practice from three to six 
but I've been on USC's campus. I've been on UCLA's campus. When I look at like those two schools, I look at them, I look at them as like a pro transition, right? Where you got guys getting up, doing stuff, right? With the team, go to class, they come back to the course for some one-on-one, right? Or two players and a coach. Then they may come back later for a higher entire team practice. Tell us what a day at a large program like USC would look like from an individual standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if if players weren't practicing twice a day, they were not going to make the transition. So, you know, maybe you work out twice or three times a week, uh, but like players like Robert Farah and Steve Johnson, they're in the weight room every day. Um, every day they're working with the strength coach. They're, they're trying to become a better athlete. They're trying to become a stronger athlete. And, you know, there's a big difference between a pro athlete and a college athlete. And, and then, you know, two or three times a week, they'd have an individual, either with myself or the assistant, or, or maybe they go hit with someone else. But for me, if I had two players on the court, I couldn't do nearly as much as if I just had one player. If I had one player on the court, I could cater to that person. We can, we can zone in on exactly what that person needs and we work on it. And, you know, my whole thing in coaching was I wanted all my guys to have a complete game and I don't care what strings you're playing with, what racket you got. It's still hard to hit a backhand on the run passing shot at five, four add out. And that's, and that's, you know, what I really felt like in all of those NCAA titles is if we could put pressure on people, you know, we were in a good position and a lot of college players and a lot of juniors play a baseline game, but you know, look, we had, you had to be good from the baseline. Obviously tennis is played from the baseline, but take the ball early, get into the net. And that's exactly how Pancho Segura taught me, you know, 45 years ago. That's, that's exactly what he was telling me. Take time away, take time away, get the ball early, put pressure on him. That was Pancho to a T. So I, I was just, you know, doing that. And he was one of the best strategy coaches I've ever seen. And you know, he had no serve, but man, that, that guy could move and he could take the ball early. He was, he was a special human being. So you want, you, you, you go on from Pepperdine to USC, you win four national championships. As you were talking, you talk about, you know, it's hard to hit a running backhand, uh, a backhand on the run late in the match. Right. And immediately I had this image of Steve Johnson trying to hit a backhand chip passing shot. <laughs> yeah. I guess the other girl, man. It's, it's, oh. You know, I mean, look, I've known Stevie since he was 12. Um, you know, um, Steve, his father, taught, taught him to hit a forehand out of the backhand corner. You know, that was his big thing, uh, to really teach that forehand out of that backhand corner. And, and so, you know, when Stevie was 12, he had a beautiful two-hander. Um, I've seen the video. Um, but just over the years, he... He was just so aggressive with that forehand side. And let me let me tell you something. You know, people can say a lot about that slice backhand. Until you've got a hit against that slice backhand, <laughs> that is one of the most challenging shots you'll ever hit. And, you know, I, I saw this stat once that, you know, he had the heaviest slice backhand of all time. I'm sure he's probably he's like, oh, God, I hate that stat. But only, <laughs> only Federer had a heavier slice backhand. So... You know, I think over the years, guys have been more successful against it. I've seen him win so many matches with that slice backhand. It drives people crazy because one shot's low and then he runs around, hits the forehand. Such a good athlete. Um, yeah, I, I we worked a lot on his two-hander. We wanted, I was, it was, it was an argument we had over the years. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted him to hit it more. I wanted him, you know, start start college matches and only hitting it but you know that slice backhand it, it was it was a, a tricky tricky shot to hit you know I, I just watched him in Indian Wells and you know his opponent was struggling so bad with that slice I mean people that come out the first time to hit with them I've seen it so many times they're like what the hell is this what is this what is going on here so you know that was a super effective shot in college and I think what makes it because so, so I coached world team tennis for a number of years and he was always on the opposite team, the San Diego team, right? And I saw him play Tommy Paul, Nakashima, um, seen him in doubles against Raji. 
And I would say the way that he could craft a point yeah. and be the archetype of point. I mean, he's like the first guy I saw hit a backhand slice down the line so well just to set you up to run over there, have to hit a forehand cross, and right. then he just pops you with a big four. I mean, it just was it was so masterful. And then you'd be ready to serve to him, right? Game point. He's like, and, and in team tennis, you know, you could talk. So right. he would just sit there and narrate what's about to happen. Hey, Rajiv, make sure you kick it up nice and high to this side now. Nice and high up here. It's coming right here. Come on, just make sure it gets up there. I mean, just would just tell you what's about to happen and just made a career with almost basically a forehand, right? I mean, just so amazing. This, I mean, I just you know, can't even do it. So you were better, with them. Go ahead. Better called him old school, you know, when, you know, he's old school player and he, and he was, um, but yeah, I mean, Stevie's a super quiet guy off the court, but on the court, when he starts talking, that's when, you know, he's comfortable and, and <laughs> you know, bad things are going to happen for the other side. And, uh, you know, he, I, I love it. I mean, in college, he was, he was extremely confident. Uh, you know, he was arrogant and, uh, but, you know, having a big ego and a good ego is incredible in, in sports. I mean, you know, go back to so many great athletes over the years. They, they all have big egos. So that's a, that's a good thing. I remember we were, at the, we were at the COVID World Team Tennis at the Greenbrier. He was playing Brandon Nakashima. And that was like the breakout summer for b Not right? Where people were starting to see him like, oh, man, this guy's good. This guy's back in a solid. And he was just kicking the shit out of Brandon, right? So we're changing over. It was like 3-0. And, you know, Steve's just talking to him. I like that backhand. I said, Steve, do me a favor. He's a young kid. You're already tuning him up. Can you and your mustache just not talk to him while you do it? Just shut up and just let him play, right? You know, it just was make like. Him, they'll make him talk more. Right. He's like, what do you mean? I mean, you know, that kind of thing. So so you were alongside of him when he had the instability record of winning, what, 72 matches in a row? Yeah, 72 matches. You know. 72 matches. And I assume there were several matches where the streak was in jeopardy, right? I mean, along that streak, you're like, oh, man, I remember this one match where we just, it almost was the end, right? Tell me a match where it was almost the end. Well, you know, incredibly, there wasn't too many that were in jeopardy. There were a couple, I think three out of the 72, if I remember, were a, a match breaker for the third. So, you know, back then, I mean, now you see a lot of four zeros and <clears throat> then we were kind of in a transition when I played, you know, we, no one knew what a match tiebreaker was, but when he was playing, if the, if the team match was decided, you played it out. And if they split sets, then you played a match breaker. And I can remember once, um, you know, he was playing a good player, talents player. And I'm thinking in my head, oh man. It just, it just can't end like this. Like it can't end with a match breaker. And, and I'm thinking bad thoughts in my head. And he, he walks up to me, looks me straight in the eyes. I didn't say a word to him. And he goes, don't worry, coach. I got this. It's no big deal. I got it. You know, and, and he mustache was like, at the time. Yeah. Yeah. He loved the mustache. Yeah. Always. And, 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 you know, that's what kind of confidence he had. Uh, I mean, I think one of the funniest stories is we were playing University of Texas and uh, he got a tight call. He was up a set, it was maybe on serve, like two, three, two all, something like that. And the guy gave him a bad call. And I mean, number one player from Texas was a good player. And he looks across and he says, hey, you got nine more minutes in this match. I just want you to enjoy every single one of them. <laughs> and the assistant coach, Ricky comes up to me. He goes, you know, the amazing thing about it is it was exactly nine minutes. <laughs> so, you know, that that kind of, uh, you know, confidence, you could use a few other words for that. It, it was pretty and special. But, you know, when when he was winning, when he won, you know, the, <clears throat> you know, we, we kind of wanted a triple crown. We'd won four in a row, uh, which was an incredible you know, that was the biggest pressure because I didn't, you know, he had come back. He didn't need to come back. You know, he could have turned pro, signed contracts. He gave up, you know, lots of money for us. And and then he came back. We won the team. That was just a huge sigh of relief for everyone. Now he's playing singles and doubles. And 
he was, you know, he got food poisoning. He got, you know, he was just, he pulled an ab and, you know, we, we defaulted him in doubles when it started a third set in the quarters. It, it was just all too much. And I think it was the quarterfinals. He played Damajan from Virginia and he was cramping uh, terribly. Um, and I think it was like six, one, five, seven, six, two, but, you know, I remember I snuck into the Georgia locker room and, and found their huge, massive thing of pickles. And I just start taking Stevie pickle juice. <laughs> and after about five of those, the cramps went away. Um, and he was able to play pretty well in the third. And, and that was probably the one where you thought it was going to go. But, you know, in the finals, he played Eric Quigley and he couldn't hit a second serve because he couldn't go up on his. But it was just like, dude, this is it's just not not going to happen. I mean, it, that's how much momentum there was. It, it was nothing I've ever seen before or since. It, it just he was not going to be denied. And, you know, just to see that final point, I've watched more than a couple times, it, just to see the relief and on his face was, uh, you know, for all of us, it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. Well, let me ask you this, because while the streak was happening, right, he, in your mind, he was probably the most dependable player on your team. But in college tennis, we often play like, you know, challenge matches for the week. And that often determines what the lineup is going to be for the weekend. Right. If I had Stevie J on my team with that streak, anyone else on my team, is, I would just say, even if you beat him four times this week, he's still playing number one this, this weekend, right? It just doesn't matter. How did you manage the team? How did you manage the egos with basically them saying like, well, I mean, I'm, we're basically playing for number two because even if I beat him in, in a challenge match, he's still playing one. How did that go? Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of things there, really. Um, first of all, Steve's the worst practice player in the history of practice. So, you know, he used to kid and say, you know, who needs some confidence? You know, put him against me in practice, coach. So uh, that was interesting. Uh, I mean, you know, Stevie was ranked number one in college in his sophomore year, and he was playing two on the team because Robert Farah was number one in college the year before. Um you know, we won 45 dual matches in a row at one point. I um, mean, you know, to have Robert Farah, who is a Wimbledon champion, a U.S. Open champion in doubles, and Stevie, I mean, that, that's a pretty good one-two punch. Um, Robert graduated when or finished his eligibility uh, Stevie's sophomore year. But really, coaching those teams was the easiest coaching I ever did because, you know, Steve and I were in step. Uh you know, he believed in what I believed and, you know, no one was, <laughs> there were a lot of guys that would have gone against me, but no one was going against Steve. I mean, Steve ran college tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, running our team, you know, I, I didn't realize what it would be like, you know, I knew I'd lose the talent, but the next year, all of a sudden, everyone had a problem with the weight program, you know, coach players, coaching tennis players are so individualistic, right? They all have their own deal. You know, and I had a junior on the team, Emilio Gomez, and he comes up to me and I love Emmy. But he's like, hey, our, our weight program sucks. And I was like, what are you talking about? You, this is the third year you're doing it. And then I'm like in my head, oh, yeah, he'll go against me, but he ain't going to say boo to Stevie. Because <laughs> uh, Stevie liked the weight program. And, you know, I mean, that was always a, a deal with those guys. You know, you have 10 guys on the team and probably five of them hated what you were doing. They wanted to do what they did growing up. And so getting everybody on the same page, believing what you're doing was always a challenge. Um, so that was super interesting, but that, that was, those teams were the easiest to run because, you know, Stevie had it under control. Yeah. Stevie had it under control without ever saying a word. So that brings an interesting point because when you think about, what you talked about, if a guy, if a kid's not on board with your program, now he has the opportunity to transfer and put himself in the portal and, and leave out. I think it's bad for college athletics, right? For a kid to decide, I don't like this coach. I'm not getting enough playing time. I don't like the life lessons that are being provided to me. I, want, I just want the pats on the back, so I'm out of here. What advice do you have for the coaches now. I mean, I'm not really sure it's a sustainable model, right? Where you're bending every year just to keep guys happy so they stay. But what advice do you have now? Because it seems like it got out at the right time, right? Yeah, I've had people tell me that. Um, 
I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think great coaches are great coaches. You know, um, you know, look, I, I, I love coaching. It's what I was put on this earth to do. Um, it's my favorite part of every day. Um, and, and, you know, people call me old school. People call me tough. Um, you know, I raised my kids tough. Uh, I always just believed in tough love. Um, and, you know, my wife was like, man, you're kind of tough on them. And, you know, but I, I just feel like good people want challenges. And, you know, un unfortunately, like when we take away barriers for people, you know, I get it. Like there's bad things, but it's, you know, when you, <laughs> both my two oldest are working for companies and a lot is expected of them. And how are we going to prepare them for that? Like I, I, good, good coaches challenge people and good coaches, you know, want more out of you than you can expect. And, you know, our, our, you know, how I coach my juniors here is I, I, I said, look, I'm going to love you by being tough on you. And, you know, you, you have to do it in a different way. You have to do it in a positive way, which I, changed as I coached um you know I changed a lot as a coach when I had kids but you know I certainly wasn't perfect I, I was always pushing I was always you know trying to get more and more out of the players and and nobody's perfect and and, and you gotta you know sometimes you say the wrong thing and that's life and you know but I always say like hey man I got love in my heart and I'm I'm gonna love you to death by pushing you hard and, you know, if you don't like that, I, 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 I always explain that in my first call to the kids. I explained exactly how I was. I wanted them to know who I was and how I coached. And team was very important to me. And being able to work hard and listen was very important to me. So, you know, I, I just didn't want there to be surprises when they came. And, and <clears throat> I get it. You know, it, it's... It's challenging, but I, I still think great coaches are great coaches and, and kids, good players want to play for great coaches. So when you decide to leave SC, I mean, you could look back and you could say, man, he had it made, right? I mean, won four national championships. He wasn't going anywhere until when, you know, he was good and ready. How did that decision go? Was it your decision, their decision? Because you look at the transition, the alternative of, you know, traveling on tour, right? You know, I got a family as well. And that in a lot of ways is tougher on the family um, because you're not local, right? I mean, being a college coach is hard, but you're for the most part, fairly local, but traveling yeah. 38 weeks is like a whole nother challenge. How did, what was the decision like to stop coaching? You yeah, I mean, I, all my kids were out of high school. Um, I thought I was going to go coach a huge center being built in, in Carson. Uh, and unfortunately that didn't work. Um, and then, I started coaching Steve and added Sam Corey to that. And I mean, it was just a super weird time to coach uh, during the pandemic. Um, I, I didn't mind traveling, um, you know, but I, I, after a year and a half of that, I, I just felt like, man, this isn't, this isn't really what I'm put on earth to do. Uh, you know, I, you know, look, your, your game plan against Roger Federer, your game planning, you know, I mean, that is super fun and challenging and exciting, but I don't know, for me, I, a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid, as frustrating as that can be someday, I love like the extended product. You, you work with someone and four or five years later, you have this, this version of the person that is a little different. And if you're responsible for 2% of that, you know, 1%, whatever percent that is, you know, that's something to be really proud. And, you know, you, I used to always say like, you know, you turn boys into men and they come to you as boys and they graduate as men. And, you know, one of my, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was a really funny story. Uh, you know, uh, Eric Johnson's mom uh, said to me, <laughs> He said, you know, I hated you for three years. And I was really taken aback by that. I, I, I mean, she's a wonderful, wonderful human person, lady. Uh, but man, that's not something you want to hear. And I was like, huh, what? And she goes, but now I love you. 
She goes, you made my son earn it. And um, he's a man because of you. And I was just like in tears. And I was like, you know, but, you know, I, I did make people earn it. And, and some people, you know, took that the wrong way. But all I wanted was the best. And, and I think, you know, if you're just coaching tennis, that's boring to me. I always wanted to coach the human. And I wanted to make people better in life through tennis. And, and that's what I looked at with my three children. I, I, yeah, I would have loved for them to win Wimbledon, but more importantly, I just wanted them be, to become really good humans through having that experience of playing sports. And, you know, dad was a tennis coach. He wasn't a baseball or basketball or coach. So, you know, I mean, fortunately for them, they all, you know, fortunately for me, they all chose tennis maybe right. unfortunately for them, they chose tennis, but uh, you know, it, 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 I just think there's so many incredible life lessons in tennis because right. You, you, you're out there by yourself and you got, there's only one person you can count on in life and that's you. And at the end of the day, you got to take care of your business. And if you can do that on a tennis court, you can do anything. So you got three kids and all of them great tennis players. And you know, I've talked to a lot of coaches, you know, Macy, Saviano, right? And it's like a lot of times great tennis coaches, kids, I mean, you're coaching so many other kids in the academy, you don't actually have that much time to spend with your kids, right? You're coaching, you know, <laughs> top 25 program, four-time national championship, USC, Stevie J, individual workouts that you talked about. Where did you find the time? And how did you keep the process healthy enough that they stuck with it. Cause my daughter quit. You know what I mean? It's just like, and my kids now, I mean, they, they want to bring their scooters to the tennis court so they can ride the scooter on the tennis court. They don't give a crap about hitting a tennis ball. Yeah. I, I don't know. I was blessed with a lot of energy and I had a ton of drive. I still do. Um, you know, I mean, more, almost more impressive is I coached every team. You know, and I didn't coach baseball, but I coached basketball. I coached football. I coached everything. And I wanted to be a part of their lives so bad. And, you know, when you're the head coach, you can kind of bend the schedule a little bit. Um, you know, they wanted to be with dad. And uh, that's the biggest compliment you can get. Um, we spend a lot of time playing golf now. But, uh, you know, it, it, you just, yeah, I mean, it's hard because, you get paid to coach tennis, right? So you don't get paid a hundred dollars an hour to coach your kids. And my <laughs> wife, my my wife used to call it the Jerry Springer show. And uh we would come home from dinner and you know, one kid would be sent home walking and another kid would throw his racket over the fence. I mean, it was my wife would be like, What the heck is going on out here? And I'm like, we're working it out, honey. We're working it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah there, there's some there's some fun memories in there and you know I think the thing that kept my kids going the most is playing father-son tennis and they all wanted to play father-son tennis it was a big deal in La Jolla and you know that I I felt like that kept them in tennis and you know I, I just kept coming I just kept coming every day and uh you know I I we practiced early twice a week so on those days I taught their clinic and I was down there feeding balls from four to six and after practicing one to three and, you know, and then I'd work with them a little bit afterwards and there were some full days, but uh, you know, you're just blessed. You're just blessed that your kids want to spend time with you. And, and to this day, my son Tanner said to me, Oh, you just want to be right. And I said, I never want to be right with you ever, right. ever. I'm, I'm just happy you're here. So don't right. ever say that about me because you can win every argument. You got it. It's all yours, bud. Right. But just come, come home, come hang out. You know, that that's all we want. I mean, family's everything. So, so you want a father and son goal ball. And for those in the tennis world knows what a goal ball means, right? That's like a significant yeah. thing. Who played yeah, the backhand we, side? I mean, were there any <laughs> like, come on, bro, did you really blow the overhead? Right. I mean, like, yeah. Hey, like my wife said, you know, we worked it out. I, I was pretty demanding on the court. And, and, it, and it's funny now, I, one of the, my funnest memories in life is uh, one year I was playing with Riley in our first round and I walk up to him and I hand, hand him the balls and he goes, that's right, I'm serving first, that's right. 
you know, I've been fortunate to win national championships with all of them. Um, you know, but we look back and, you know, obviously winning is much better than losing, but we have some classic stories of losing. We're <laughs> just like going nuts and crying and go, you know, just some really, you know, uh, you know, look, you want to control your, your you want to make your kids happy, right? Like, with, when you're you got a break point and it's on you to make them happy <laughs> let me tell you something that's right. nerves that is nerves i mean when i won i we won la jolla the hard courts and i'd won it twice with tanner twice with riley and it was coulter's turn to win and we won and coulter played unbelievable in the finals and we won and i just broke down crying and felt like we won our fourth ncaa championship <laughs> and i looked at my wife and i said this is just tennis right this is just tennis it really right. just doesn't mean that much and i was like oh god thank god we won i know right it could not right. be the last one and not get a goal <laughs> you feel like it's so important but at the end of the day right sports is in on the sports section for a reason it, it's nice but it, it's not going to you know, solve uh, cancer. Right, right, right. So where can people find you now, right? So now you're coaching at a prestigious club. Uh, let me not say prestigious, historic, right? Because prestigious means it makes it sound very exclusive and right. intimidating, but historic. Tell us about, because now people actually have access to you. You're not coaching college, you're not traveling. The common man can now get to you. So tell us where the, 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 the Californians can come and get a piece. Yeah, well, you know, I, Super lucky. This is just a gem of a club. It's it's an old school tennis and swim club. We got 13 tennis courts. We got an Olympic sized pool. We got a beautiful little clubhouse that we redid last year and made it into a sports bar. Super cool. We got a cafe serving, you know, sandwiches and wraps. Uh, and you got pickleball. And we, uh, you know, we're like, uh, we're, you know, we're going to have a pickleball night tomorrow night. It's. <laughs> We, we put pickleball on one of the courts, temporary lines, and the person said, I'll be back here in six months doing the court next to you. And that was two years ago, so he hasn't been back. I mean, our club is full every day. I mean, for five hours, at least five hours every single day, every court is packed, and it's equity-owned. Um, so hopefully it'll be here forever. And, you know, Jack Kramer started it. Vic Braden was the first pro. Robert Landsdorf was the second pro. So you know, it's like, it's like going to USC. You got, you got big shoes to fill. And, and I'm aware of that. Um, you know, it's just some incredible people. Tracy Austin still plays here a couple times a week. Her son, Brandon is here all the time. Uh, B Holt is practicing. It's great to be around him after coaching him at SC. And, you know, it's, it's a special place. We got Eva Jovic who won the orange bowl and is top 10 in the world as a 15 year old. Um, you know, we got sectional champions, Andy Johnson, you know, we just got some really good players and it, it's fun. And every day I do clinic and I look at that as college practice. And, and unfortunately for them, some days I treat it like college practice. And, you know, I, I, I demand a lot and want a lot and love them a lot. And, you know, I love them hard. So, you know, I, that's, you can't be afraid to do that. And, and you just have to do it in the right way in a very positive way but you know challenging people is a good thing so how are you dealing with the the difference and i say difference meaning when you're coaching in college the parent drops the kid off it really don't bother you unless something's going wrong right, <laughs> that's, right? A the pro. that's a myth right right <laughs> call me why my kid play three instead of two this uh, week you know that's I mean? a myth right. i mean I'll, I'll tell you the the funniest one and, and i won't name the name but uh <laughs> Because I, I love the dad, I love the son, but I had a father knock on my door at 8.15 at night once to complain about the lineup. <laughs> and my, my kids were young and he, my wife sent all the kids out at nine to say goodnight to me and it finally got to him. He said, okay, I'll, I'll leave. But, you know, so, uh, you know, parents love their kids with passion and they're not afraid to. Um, you know, what's the difference? I mean, look, the best thing about coaching college was, was being a teacher. You know, I always felt like I was a teacher, not a coach. So, you know, I can teach here uh, and I teach every day and I teach adults and, you know, that's challenging and fun. And I teach a lot of kids, you know, I still work with a lot of 
top kids and that and that's super fun but what you miss um what i loved about college was was teaching was building uh we you know we put it over a million dollars into this club in the last two years and just completely changed it renewed every aspect of the club it's just a beautiful club and you know we're all super proud of that everyone helps me with that um but you know man there is something about walking out playing for an ncaa championship you know and you know i won five you know team and three individual and you know that you know when it, when i watch somebody win something i know how they feel um because we were there and you know so that that's a real hard one to replace and i i miss that dearly um but i i had my time mm -hmm. and you know i'm 58 and i'm just so appreciative you know uh of everything and you know they're putting me in the hall of fame in in a couple months and i i i don't feel like i'm that old <laughs> i'm 58 <laughs> I'm 58, but you know, uh, you know, that saying when we were Kings and, you know, I, I'm, I, I did a lot in my life and I'm super appreciative for it. Well, I'm shocked to hear you say you teach adults. The only time I teach adults now is when I fill in for one of my pros and called off. And the thing that keeps me off the court with an adult is not being able to reshape the swing. You know, when you're teaching an adult, you got to just be satisfied with getting the ball from the strings to the blue. You know, the C is not perfect. You know, you just say this, this body movement, the way your body moves is just probably never going to change. So let me just get this, let me get this ball off the strings into the blue. That part, I have a hard time because the adult doesn't have enough hours for me to retrain that entire, I, I can't tolerate it. So I just, when I, when I started coaching on tour, that was one of the lines of business that I gave up was the adults who got to go to work, got to cancel on me, got to like, you know, they started in the park and I got to reshape it. They don't have enough time for me to really do it right. All right, I got to go. Right. The hardest thing in life to do, right, is to change habits. Yes. So you have someone that's been playing tennis for 30 years the wrong way. Oh, man. It's pretty hard to do it, but you know, like I've worked with one um, lady here for the last two years, and you know, it 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 comes sometimes a little slower, but you can do some things. And I, you know, I think a lot of times with adults, they're they're very comfortable at talking about being uncomfortable, <laughs> but they're very uncomfortable of being uncomfortable. And <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I've started to take golf lessons, so I. I played golf my whole life and really I thought my swing was good and and he found a lot of things wrong with it and I was like man this is so uncomfortable so it's super helpful for me to go through that to know how my students feel and man I I struggle with that like man change is hard that's all I gotta say so you know just just having patience uh and as long as they got a little you know a little motivation to keep coming back each week and little maybe, personality Maybe maybe you do an, a half an inch, a quarter of an inch, but yeah. you know, after two years, you know that it builds up. So uh, it's all it's all good as long as people have have the right attitude. All right, well, give us the website or give us the, the name of the club one more time for those Californians who are in need of a little jolt. Yeah, it's in it's in Palos Verdes, California, Rolling Hills Estates. I, that sounds too hoity-toity for me. I'm very not <laughs> hoity-toity. Uh, but it's called the Jack Kramer Club. And Jack Kramer was one of the greats of our time. And, uh, you know, he started this club and in 1971, he sold it to the members. So the members have owned, owned it since then and special place. So, uh, you know, get on that website, you know, get in touch, say hello, whatever. You know, I, I still talk to so many parents and different things. And so I, I find that uh, super enjoyable. Oh man, it's the best thing. I, I always get text messages and emails from former players like, hey, I'm interviewing for a position at Fox News as an anchor. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? I'm yeah. like, let me just the good and the bad. You want me to mix it up? I got a lot of bad. I cause you know, I got a lot of attitude times and times Let's I have to smash your iPhone. Real. Yeah. They're like, just make it all positive. Let's keep the bad stuff to between us, right? Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw a girl today and 
I hadn't seen her in like 14 years. She was 30 years old. She's had a meeting at the club and she's like, it's Gabby. I'm like, holy cow. I, last time I saw you were 16 or 17. So, you know, I mean, you know, touching people's lives and having any kind of an effect in a positive way on someone is, uh, you know, it's an honor. All right, before I let you go, I got to get your take on the big three moving out, or maybe two of the big three sort of ushering out, Novak hanging on and entering Alcaraz TFO. What do you think about this next wave? Uh, and who do you see just behind them that we need to be looking out for? Well, you know, I think it's a great thing for tennis. We loved Fed. We loved Rafa. I mean, I just saw Novak lost today, but let's face it. I mean, where was it? It was Indian Wells. You know, I was down there early. I was watching. Then I was home. I, you know, I can't remember who he was playing, the Italian. Um, I looked at Tanner. I'm like, I think this is the best tennis player of all time. And my son, Riley, was like, what are you talking about? You can't say that. He's won like one grand slam. I'm like, right. what he's doing out here? Like, he's a combination of everybody. Like, his backhand and groundies are good. He's quick. He can serve and volley. I guess he could have a little better serve. I mean, like, it's incredible to watch these guys. But, you know, I think we're really excited just about the Americans and, you know, the the big push from Taylor and, you know, all these guys are are just Tommy Paul. They're they're having a great push and, and there's a lot of them. You know, there's, you know, like you were talking about earlier, Brandon Nakashima, who's, you know, I watched from a very young age. He was playing my son when he was 10. And, uh, you know, all those guys are so good. So, you know, America has to be relevant and, and hopefully Francis keeps it going and it looks like they're all headed in the right direction. And, and to me, that's what's exciting, you know. Uh, you know, it's great. You know, we have a great Spaniard, great Italian, but we need we need an American like in the semis of Grand Slam. And and these guys are going to do it. That's for sure. They have the confidence and they have the skills to do it. And and they're you know, I mean, they can do it. So that to me is exciting. Let's let's get some some freak <laughs> some Americans. You know, I can remember Courier, Fourth of July finals of Wimbledon. Uh, we got to get that back. We yeah. got to get back yeah and i think it's good for tennis when you think about tennis you think about wimbledon probably being the most prestigious slam when you think about the u.s open just being from a money from a money from a marketing from a viewership that is the super bowl of our sport and if we can have like the year slow one u.s open it was four americans in the semis right yeah. and i mean that or three three of the four american three three americans of the four in the semis and i mean that or maybe it was four I mean, that is like what we need, the entire sport, because it grows the money for yeah. all of tennis. It grows the marketing for all of tennis. And as that goes, it influences the bottom. It influences more coaches stay in tennis, right? right? More juniors, you know, start playing. And, you know, juniors are always torn. Do I go play basketball? Do I stay with tennis, right? So, I mean, the more money we can have in the sport marketing, I think it, it improves. And, and quite frankly, we've got to figure out a way to get Americans to sort of hold the spot at the top so that the other players from the other countries can also benefit off the marketing. Yeah, we got to do it. I mean, look, the US Open is our Super Bowl. Yeah. I, look, we've been, both of us have been to all the slams. We know how special all of them are. Yes. Because all are. <laughs> Australian Amazing. Open, wow, this yeah. is incredible. You can't yeah. even explain to people how incredible the Australian Open is. French Open, Wimbledon, I mean, Wimbledon, are you kidding me? Everybody's right. got to go. But then you got, you know, kind of the granddaddy of them all, the U.S. Open in New York City. And, you know, for players and coaches, not that much fun because it's such a hassle, but right. it is the Super Bowl of tennis in our country. And, and we got, you know, Francis getting to the quarters last year was a great, great thing for us. And so that's good. All right. Well, Peter, we, Peter I want to thank you for your time. Um, you, know, you are a legend in the game. When I finally saw who it was under the hat and under the sunscreen, I was like, oh, that's Peter Smith. I'm yeah, like, wow. I, you know? I think I got that hat right here. Where is it? All that? right. <laughs> I got that hat right here. Is, is this it? This is the, the version. There it is. Gotta put it on, man. There, there it is. Camera. 
And and you know, you're at the country club now, so it looked like you shaved a little bit. Back on the tour, it was looking like, damn, you haven't shaved yeah. in about six weeks, right? I can't, I can't go on out. This is like the, the guy from uh this is Ed Ed Murray or what was that guy's name from uh that golf movie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's been an honor to chat with you, man. Good luck. Uh all the best at the club. And we'll look forward to hearing from you soon. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with one of the greatest coaches in all of college tennis history, Peter Smith. Thanks for listening.